Well, good morning, South Bay Community Church, and good morning to all our guests and friends who may be here for the first time this morning. We're so glad you can be here to worship with us. Um, congratulations to, to, to Sophia for being dedicated to the Lord. Um, speaking of just children, uh, Britt, I don't know where you're sitting, if you're here, but uh, there you are. Britt and his wife Veronica just gave birth this past Monday to baby Presley. Would you guys congratulate Britt and Veronica? And also uh, Cheryl and Mike Canty Herrera gave birth this week as well. And so we're looking forward to some pictures and meeting those babies as they come to church. So God's doing some good things. He's growing the church one by one. So praise the Lord. You know, speaking of babies, I, I was at a baby shower yesterday. It was my sister-in-law's baby shower. And it's crazy. This girl, she's, she's about to pop. This, this baby's going to come. She, she's She's coming. Here, here's the thing. I was thinking back to the first time they made the announcement way back at month number one. And she told us that she was pregnant. And I, and I look at her and she did not look pregnant. She says, oh, no, I'm expecting. I, I said, I, I can't tell. But apparently the doctor confirmed it. The signs were pointing to it. They got the, the picture of the baby. And indeed, she's pregnant. They're expecting. Well, yesterday when I saw her, man, she has come a long way, and it could be any day now. Definitely, there's a baby in there. They're definitely expecting. But when I think about that, she was expecting at month one no more than she's, she was expecting yesterday. She's still expecting today. It's just now that when we see her, she's, she's nearer now than ever. I mean, it, it's, it's ready. We can see it. It's visible to, to everybody. There, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that a baby's coming. You know, First Peter is the book we're studying today. It's a series where we've been in called Faith Under Fire, and, and Peter writes this book, and he wrote with urgency. He, he wrote with great expectation. He said, Jesus is coming. There's going to be an arrival. But the thing is, he wrote that 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. It's been 2,000 years since, and there's a lot of people today, maybe some of us in this room, and we're thinking, well, Peter, where, where, where's Jesus? Where's the arrival? Where's the coming? And I think, you know, when he wrote that, he wrote with expectation. And today, I believe we sit here with expectation, the same expectation that he has that there's going to be an arrival. I think now we're just near, more, more close to it than ever. It's nearer now more than ever. The signs are pointing to it. And so I want, I want to show you, when he wrote with that conviction, he agreed with all the apostles that we were entering into one of the final eras of human history. That, that was no doubt in his mind. I just think he was writing in month number one, and today we may very well be in month nine. It could be any day now. Can, can I show you how I've come to, to believe that? In, in the Bible... All throughout the Old Testament, there's this theme, there's this pattern that God has for us. Six, then one. Six, then one. It's kind of like a rhythm. Six, and then one. For example, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and the universe in how many days? Six. And then on the seventh, he rested. Second book of the Bible, Exodus, all scattered throughout. But for example, in chapter 23, he tells the Jews, you're to sow the land for six years, toil and labor, work the land for six years, but then on the seventh year, give it a rest. Seventh year rest. Book of Leviticus, third book of the Bible. Ten commandments are given to the, to the people of God, and one of the commandments was you guys are to labor for six days, work six days, rest on the seventh. And we're going to call that the Sabbath day. Why? Well, the very basis given was because your God, the Lord your God, created the universe, the heavens and the earth, and all that was in it in six days and rested on the seventh. And because he did that, so shall you, his people. So you see all throughout, and there's many more examples, six and then one. Six and then one. Well, Peter himself wrote in the second book, Second Peter, verse 8, he says, Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. If you look at human history from a biblical perspective, we go back to, to Adam, okay? And when Adam fell, 
the land was cursed. God said, you're now going to have to work, you're going to have to toil and, and labor in the land. From Adam to the time of Abraham, it was about 2,000 years. You, you can trace the lineage, count up all the years between the sons, 2,000 years between Adam and Abraham. Then from Abraham to the time of Jesus, another major era in biblical history or human history, 2,000 years. You could count it up, the lineage from, from Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years. And then from Jesus, when he came, he died, he resurrected, he sent it back into heaven to the present day. How many years has it been? It's been about 2,000 years. How many years is that total? 6,000 years. 6,000. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that there's going to be a major end time event where Jesus, after he comes and arrives in the clouds, he's going to rapture up the church. All the dead and alive in Christ are going to be raised into heaven. They're going to be glorified. Then Christ is going to come back to earth with the glorified saints. And then it's going to be a thousand years of reign where Christ reigns on this earth. We call that the millennial kingdom. It's going to be a thousand years of peace this is when all the covenants of God are going to be finally realized. Israel will be restored. Israel will experience rest from the nations. It's going to be peace. 6,000 years of toil, 6,000 years of suffering, wrestling with evil, working the land, and then 1,000 years of peace. And that's going to be ushered in by the coming of Christ. Now, church, where are we on this timeline? We're about at the 6,000-year mark. This is where we are today. I believe we may very well be in the ninth month. It could be any day now. When Peter wrote 2,000 years ago, this is the end. The end of all things is near. He was writing with expectation. He's coming. He knew that this was the final era of human history. All that we have left now that Christ has come, he's died, he's risen. All that we have left now is for him to come again. And that's the end. And today, we're still waiting 2,000 years later at the 6,000-year mark. It could be any moment now. It could be today. It could be as I'm speaking. We're living in the last days of church. We, we have to alter the way we're living. We have to change the way we're living. Christ can come any moment now. And so how do we live? I want to show you a few ways from today's passage, 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me as we read 1 Peter chapter 4. And before we get into that, let me pray and ask God to, to speak to us right now. Let's pray. God, we just want to pause right now, come before you, because we want to be absolutely sure that, that we're hearing from you and your truth and your words, Lord. I, I beg you, and I'm sure everybody sitting here would agree with me, Lord, we don't want to hear from a man. We don't want to hear ideas that come from a man. Lord, we want to hear from you from your spirit. So Lord, would you be the one who saturates this message with your truth? Let us be convinced and convicted that it's coming only from you, that it's done in your strength and your knowledge and your wisdom and truth. I pray for everybody in here right now, Lord, as we're listening, Lord. Some of us may have been in that place. Maybe we come in here today thinking, yeah, Jesus might come. He may not. I don't know when. But Lord, let us, let us sense that urgency, Lord. Lord, we're losing daylight, and so I pray that we would live like it. Move us to live in a way that most pleases you, God. Lord, as I always pray, I pray that I wouldn't be sex successful this morning, that I wouldn't be very effective, this, memorable, this message wouldn't be very memorable unless it's coming from you. And so would you do that? Teach us this morning. We beg you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. When I was in college, I uh, went to UC Irvine and I took a sociology class there. And, you know, there, there are hundreds of people in that class. And, and one thing the professor did was he broke us into these little groups of about 20 to 25 people. And we were supposed to go off and do a social experiment. He, he called it the commune weekend, and so we were supposed to lock ourselves up in some kind of house or a cabin and, and just kind of see what happens. Like, how do we survive? How do we get along with each other? How do we deal with each other? And so my group, we went up to Big Bear. We rented out a cabin, and th this group was so diverse, everything from 
frat guys to sorority girls, from gym, gym rat meatheads to bookworm nerds, all across the board, different people. And yet when we arrived at that cabin that weekend, I found out, man, actually everybody has a, a lot of things in common. For example, everybody there loved to drink. That, that, no doubt about that. First night, man, all the alcohol came out. So many people there loved to smoke weed. And if you didn't smoke weed, you were definitely open to, to taking a few hits and joining in on the party. I mean, everybody shared many things in common, no matter where you came from. And I, I'll never forget, as we sat in that living room, we made a circle, and we were trying to break the ice, try to get to know each other a little bit better. And so people would throw out questions, and we would go around and, and answer the question. And one of the questions that this girl asked, I'll never forget, is she goes, Okay, how about this? Where's the craziest place you've ever had sex? And so, so one by one, they go around the circle, and everybody, I, it was outrageous, the stuff I was hearing. I mean, I was surprised that everybody, I, whether they were lying or not, trying to look good or not, they, they all had a story of the craziest place or their craziest sexual experience, and it's going around the room. And then finally, after most people had already shared, it got to me. I said, Greg, how about you? Where's the craziest place you've ever had sex? And I sit there, and everybody's looking at me, and I go, well, I've, I've never had sex. <laughs> and everybody's like, no, shut up. No, that's not fair. You've got to share. Everybody shared. And I was like, no, no, seriously, guys. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I'm, I'm really trying to, s- to save it till marriage. Like, shut up. Come on. All right, if you're not going to share next. And, and, and it was just this weird moment for me. And that whole weekend was just weird because, because when they would drink, I would kind of be off in the corner. And when everybody would be smoking out, I'd be off by myself. And I was truly the black sheep of that place. I, I was seriously the outcast. And I found it really strange that everybody there had a story to share. But I think it was even more weird that everybody there thought that I didn't have a story to share. It was even more weird for them. And... and Peter tells us, Christians, that's how it's going to be. If you choose to pursue holiness and you pursue Jesus Christ and you try to live free from sin, it's going to be weird for people. They're going to look at you. They're going to be shocked. Look what 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through 6 says. I want to read you this passage. He's talking to Christians now in the last days. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they, talking about Christians, they don't live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. They are surprised. Would you underline that? They're surprised. They're shocked that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to his spirit. And we'll pause right there. Guys, as Christians living in the last days, once again, It's got to be a passionate pursuit of ours to be like Jesus, to be holy, to live free from sin. And as you pursue holiness, it's going to shock people. It's going to be strange to them. And so here's here's the end time strategy I want to share with you guys. I have two today. Here's the first end time strategy. Would you write this down? Shock and awe. Shock and awe. Shock them by your pursuit of holiness and pray that it leaves them in awe of the holy God inside of you. We want to shock and awe. Some of you guys, you know, I know sitting here, given the amount of people in this room, some of you guys have your stories. You guys have stories. Back in the day, man, some of you guys used to be the most high. And by most high, I don't mean most high. I mean most high, like you were like the most stoned in college. Or, or maybe you were the most drunk all the time. Or maybe you are the wildest and craziest person at the party. People know you for that. But today, chances are you sit here as a believer. You're a new creation in Christ. You're different now. You, you must be different now. You're not like that anymore. 
How, how do you know if you're a true believer or if you're a true follower of Jesus Christ? Well, I love this quote by John MacArthur. He puts it like this. Sin in the believer is a burden which afflicts him rather than a pleasure which delights him. Meaning everybody in here, we all sin. We all stumble and we'll all occasionally fall into sin. But if you're a believer, your sin no longer is a delight to you. It's not something you love or or take pleasure in. It now afflicts your soul. I'm not okay with this. I keep falling, but I'm not okay with this. I got to change. I got to be someone different. That's the mark of a true believer. That's the fruit. And so if that is you, now we strive to live different. We strive to live holy. We strive to be like Jesus. People in Peter's day, as he was writing to these people in the, in the Roman Empire, these Christian converts once were pagans. They were living in Rome, and they would do as the Romans would do. Everything, all the social activities would require them to get drunk, would require them to engage in sexual immorality, or maybe in, engage in pagan idol worship. That, that was the Roman life. That was the culture. And now that they're Christian converts, they had to start abstaining from all those activities. And they had to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. They had to make a choice. And it was strange to people. People knew what they once were like. And now they see him now and they're like, man, what, what happened to Octavius, man? He used to be the life of the party. Man, Claudius was like, man, he, he, he used to drink it up. Now, now what happened to them? And it was weird to them. And that's why Peter says in in a verse, I believe it was verse 4, he says, it, it, it's strange, they're surprised, they, they wonder why you don't join with them, and now they heap abuse on you. In fact, it was so weird, there was a term for Christians, actually it was coined by Nero himself, they were called haters of humanity, because they're so countercultural. they kept always going against and protesting the things that the culture would do. They were haters of what everybody else is doing, haters of humanity. And so they were persecuted for it. Some even lost their lives for it. That was the threat they were facing. And that's why Peter writes this book, First Peter, and he's encouraging them, guys, hey, at the end of the day, what does it matter? What does it matter if they kill you? And I know that's a pretty Pretty bold statement. That's a strong statement, but that's the thrust of what Peter is saying. He said, what does it matter if they end up killing you? Because remember, verse 1, he's saying, remember when Jesus hung on the cross? When he hung there, understand, Hebrews tells us this, verse 12, it says that he despised its shame. He scorned its shame. Jesus did not enjoy the cross. He hated it, and yet he went through with it. Why? One of the reasons why was because he knew that if I would just go through with this, if I would just die on the cross, sin will be dealt with. We will be done with sin. And so I'm going to go through the cross. And so Peter says in verse 1, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Look, you're being attacked right now. Arm yourselves. Protect your mind. Protect your heart. Take on the attitude of Christ. Because even if they kill you, verse 1 tells us, you'll be done with sin. If you suffer just like Christ did, even to the point of death, you'll be done. And isn't that true? This is a new perspective. This is a paradigm shift that that as Christians, if we die, we're done with sin. It can no longer tempt us. It can no longer torment us. It can no longer torture us. We will be finally, really done with sin. And if, if that's our pursuit right now, and we're passionate about being holy and living free from sin and being like Christ, that should be something to rejoice over. That's, that's the end goal, to be done with sin. And so think about this. This is the perspective we Christians now have in this world. It's a win-win situation. You let me live, and I get to pursue Christ and enjoy Christ here on earth. And who, who doesn't want to live? We all want to live. But if you kill me and you threaten me and you take my life, I still win. Because no longer am I pursuing Christ because now I've attained him. Now I'm with him in his presence. Now I'm like him in his holiness. You could let me live or let me die. And so it's like enemy. The worst thing you can do to me, your greatest threat against me, the threat of death, is ineffective. Satan, the worst thing you can do to me is actually the best thing you can do to me. Because now you're bringing me into the presence of my Lord and my Savior because I'm saved. 
So that's why I think Paul writes, remember Philippians chapter 1, he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You let me live, I get to enjoy Christ. You let me die, I get to enjoy Christ. It's a win-win situation. And so Paul, Peter says, protect yourselves. Put on the attitude of Christ. It's a win-win situation. They can do whatever they want to do to you. They may persecute you. They may even kill you. We have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with that. But what if... I just want to say this, what if you live so differently and you're pursuing holiness and it shocks people, but instead of persecuting you, what if some people are left in awe? What if they look at you and say, why why are you like that? Why are you so convicted? Why are you being so different from the world? And what if it leaves them in awe, not just of you, but ultimately they're, they're in awe of the God inside of you? You know, I, I, I used to work in Irvine. After I graduated, I became a manager in this company, the manager of a marketing and, and a sales team. And it was made up of a lot of college students and postgrads and, and, and uh, young adults. And I remember one lunch period, we were just all hanging out over lunch, and we were sitting around these tables, and we were all talking about our future aspirations. What do we want to do with our life? And the typical answers around the room coming from young adults especially, is they want to make a lot of money. They want to climb corporate ladders. They want to be entrepreneurs, start their own businesses. They want to succeed in life. Who doesn't? And then they came around to me. They said, how about you, Greg? Do you think you'll be in this company forever? You think you're going to take over this place? And I, and I told him, actually, I'm, I'm applying for seminary. I, I want to be a pastor in a church one day. And they were shocked It shocked them. Are you kidding me? You're a manager. You could just make more money from this point on. Why would you go backwards, make less money, and work in a church? And there's one guy in particular. His name was Derek. It sincerely shocked him. How do I know? Because he said, Greg, hey, can we we go out to, to lunch sometime? Can I talk to you a little bit more about what you shared today? Turns out as we would meet and and eat and and share conversation, he was so intrigued that I would based on my spiritual convictions, give everything up to help people. And he told me, he says, you know, because I feel like I'm a spiritual person. I believe in a higher power, and I feel like I need to help people with this. And, and I talked him through that. I said, you know what, you are a spiritual person. I was able to show him that God has created all, us all to be spiritual. And that higher power, power that you acknowledge, there's one higher power. His name is Jesus, the God of the Bible. And I, and I pointed him to the gospel And it was amazing, the conversations we had. Since our conversations, Derek has enrolled in seminary to become a spiritual leader one day. He has since graduated from theological seminary. And I I don't know what God has in store for his life, but I just pray that God's anointing would be upon him, that he would lead people standing in awe of the Jesus he points them to. What if we live in such a way, pursuing holiness, knowing that some people will, will be you know, persecutors of us, but what if we can leave some people standing in awe of who God is, and one day they too will start chasing him? So that's the first thing I want to encourage you guys with. Shock and awe. Pursue holiness. Shock people, but pray that they'll be left in awe of the holy God inside of you. Here's the second thing I want to share with you guys. Would you write this down? End time strategy. Serve and awe. Serve and all. Let me read you verse 7 to 9. It says this. The end of all things is near. Underline that. That's what he's talking about. We're we're losing daylight. It's, It's urgent. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. We'll stop right there. He's saying, look, we don't have time to waste, guys. We have to live like he's coming. It's the end of the age. He's coming. And so he gives a list. And you know it's not going to be chit-chat at this point. He's not going to be talking nonsense. No, I'm going to give you instructions on how to now live with urgency. So he tells us we got to pray, be sober-minded. we got to love, meaning forgive, cover a multitude of sins. We don't have time to not love. He says we have to show hospitality to strangers, bring them in so that Christ's work can be done. 
But then he says this, and I want to focus on verse 10 and on, because this is the most space he devotes to the passage. He says this in verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In the last days, out of all the things he can say and instruct the Christians, the followers of Christ, he says, look, use your gifts and serve. We don't have much time left. Use your gifts and serve. That's urgent. Why? Well, because our gifts are given to us for a purpose. The reason, the, the point of Jesus giving us gifts is to use the gifts to point back to Jesus. Isn't that true? The point of why Jesus gave us gifts is to use the gifts to point back to Jesus. Look at him. Look at your Savior, the lover of your soul. Call upon his name. We should use them to leave people standing in awe of him so that he would receive praise and glory. I love this. This past week, our, our staff, we were doing devotions and Romans chapter 12, 11. Can you check out that verse? It's in your Baywatch notes. Romans 12, 11. This is, this is the, the word of God is exciting. Let me show you. He says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And Romans 12 is a passage where Paul's talking about spiritual gifts, the gifts of the church. And then he says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. How many Christians in here, you've, you've experienced that Christian roller coaster where you, you were once really high on fire for God. You felt like this close to God. You know, I love God so much. He's so awesome. You're on fire. Then time goes on and it's kind of like, well, I remember those days. I feel distant from him. I still believe, but it's, it's not like that anymore. But then there's this spiritual experience. Maybe you go on a retreat or something happens in your life and it's like, man, I remember these days. I feel so close to God. I'm so on fire. And then, then something bad happens and then all of a sudden it's like, I remember those days. And it's just this Christian roller coaster ride. I'm far, I'm near. I'm far, I'm near. And, and people will tell you, man, that's, that's normal. All, all of us go through that. I've told people, man, that's, that's, that's normal. Don't worry about that. But look what Paul says. He says, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Maintain it. Stay high. Stay on fire. And, and I love, this is where it gets exciting. That, that word for fervor he uses, it's the Greek word zeontes. It means literally to boil over. Boil over. It's, it's, it's the word the, the Greeks would use when you boil a pot of water. You know, I'm not a culinary expert. I, I'm not much of a cook or a chef or anything like that but in college man I, I learned to cook up a killer spaghetti man I, I out of necessity and survival I learned how to make my own spaghetti it was basically pasta and a bottle of ragu but but this is what I would do to, to get started I would take water I put it in a pot and I would turn that fire on and I'm not I'm no dummy I'm not going to sit there and wait for it to boil so I'll leave the room and I'll go do my other stuff until I hear this and I run into the kitchen, and it's boiling over. And I remember the first time I'm freaking out, so I turn off the fire, and I take it off the stove. And all of a sudden, it's weird. The, the bubbles went away. It just, it just went flat. I said, well, well, I need boiling water. How am I going to cook my pasta? So I put it back on, turn on the fire, walk away, and all. Very quickly after that, it starts boiling over again. And I freak out. I turn it down, and I take it off, and, and then the bubbles are gone. And I realized through my experience of cooking spaghetti that as long as there's a constant application of heat, of fire, it'll stay boiling. It'll keep boiling. If I remove that application, it, it can go flat pretty quickly. Paul says, keep your spiritual boil. Stay boiling over. Stay on fire for the Lord. How do you do that? Well, apparently there's got to be some kind of application, but look what the passage says. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual boil serving the Lord. You love that? I love that. Keep serving the Lord. There's got to be an application of something according to his analogy here. What's that application? I think it's the application of our gifts according to the context of Romans 12, Romans 12, serving the Lord. 
And I believe as long as we keep on serving and applying the gifts, the gifts that come from God and letting him work through us, I believe we can stay passionate and on fire for the Lord. Why? Because when we serve and use our gifts, man, we stay connected to God. We continually allow him to work through us. We continually experience his power through us. We continually are amazed at what God can do despite of who I am. We got to keep on serving. I know people who've been serving in the church and they get burnt out. Not boiling, they're burnt out. They lose the fire. Why? Because I'm doing too much. And so the solution oftentimes is I got to stop. I got to just stop serving for a season. I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't, I, no, 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 no. Keep serving. Don't, don't, don't pull out. Don't, don't stop. You keep serving. Maybe you need to adjust your plate a little bit. Take some stuff off. Maybe readjust. Maybe focus on what you're good at. Focus on your gifts. Do, do one thing. But don't stop serving altogether. It's through the serving that I believe that we will be in awe. And the people we serve will be in awe of the God we serve. Keep serving. And so Peter goes on to encourage people, and he breaks down categories of gifts into two major categories. The first one is this, verse 11. He says, he says if your gift is serving or speaking, do it as one who speaks the words of God. Do it as one who speaks the words of God. You know, I've been, you know, serving the Lord for many years. I think in terms of speaking, it's been about 11 years. I started in 2003. And uh, I I'm telling you, it, it just doesn't get old. It doesn't get mundane. Like, it's always a spiritual experience. And I, I think I speak for Pastor Gary and, and all the other pastors who speak. It's always a spiritual experience. And God is continually showing himself to us through it. Just a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago, I was up here on a Saturday night. And I'll never forget that message. Um, that message was so horrific in my mind. From a communicator's perspective, I, 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 was, I was stumbling over words the whole time. And I was slur slurring my speech, and, and I was pronouncing words rang, wrong. And to me, it was, just, it was just terrible. And I remember I, I got off the stage, and I went to the back, and I just sat there, and I was like, what just happened? That was the worst message I've ever given. To the point where I didn't even want to go out to the lobby and, and, and see any of you guys. I, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to face anybody. It was so, it was so bad, and I was so hard on myself. But I said, you know what, I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor, and I, I know I, I should go out there. So I go out there, and I'm um, just talking with people. And, and one guy comes up to me, and he says, hey, are you feeling okay? <laughs> and I go, well, not really. kind of have a headache going on right now. And he says, yeah, I could tell. Man. <laughs> He's a, and his heart was good. He wasn't trying to criticize me or anything. He's like, yeah, I could tell you were like stumbling over words. And I'm like, oh, man. They, see, people saw it. It wasn't just me. It's not just up here. People saw it. And, and he's like, yeah, you, you just weren't yourself today. Let me pray for you. And he just prays for me. That whole night, Saturday night, man, I was just so down. And you know? my wife was like, what is wrong with you, man? Because like, she wasn't there at the service. She said, what's wrong? I'm like, I just feel really down right now. Next morning, I come to church. Got to do it again in the morning. And I'm like, I don't want, I, I really don't want to go up there. I really don't want to preach this morning. I'm still kind of discouraged from the night before, and as, as we're all doing sound checks and all, Carlton, Carlton Fukumoto right here, he's the point person overseeing the service, and he comes up to me, he says, hey, is everything okay? Is the temperature okay? Was it, was it too hot last night on the stage? I go, I go, no. I'm like, no, why? I mean, it's it fine. He's like, man, I've never seen you sweat so bad on the stage. I'm like, great, you know? I'm like, I know. I said, Carlton, it wasn't hot. I, it was just going so poorly. It was rough, and I was sweating bullets. And Carlton said something that uh, just changed everything. He says, what? He's like, no, man, that, that word went through powerfully yesterday. He's like, I didn't notice. Maybe you stumbled over words. I don't know, but, man, the, the word of God went through. And from that point, I was like, really? And then afterward, later that weekend, 
It was reiterated by, by different people who, who would come up to me and share from the Saturday night service. One guy, Claire, he, he was telling me, man, he says, Pastor Greg, that was so deep. He's like, that's exactly what I've been going through. And this is like the cherry on top. God's speaking to me. I'm still trying to process it. This is deep. Go home that night and Irene Facebooks me and tells me different ways that it was speaking to her and different parts of the message that she thought was so challenging and got an email from somebody and they were encouraging me as well. And, and I was so amazed, left in awe. Because time and time again over the past 11 years, it's like I never learned, but God keeps showing himself to me that when I am weak, then he is most strong. When I am inadequate, boy, is he adequate. When I am insufficient, his grace is more than enough that when I stumble over my words, his message still goes through. His word will not return void. It's not about what I can do, but it's really what God is doing through me and through you. And over and over again, for me, I'm constantly experiencing God, and I'm constantly left amazed. I'm in awe of him. So Peter says in verse 11, if you're one who speaks, speak as if you're speaking the very words of God. Now here's the thing. A lot of us in this room have different gifts. Not many of you will be up here on stage speaking on a regular basis, but you speak. Because maybe you're a teacher or maybe your gift is encouragement, or maybe your gift is exhortation, or maybe it's wisdom, or, or knowledge, or, or counseling. You, you all have different gifts, and some require speaking. And if that's you, Peter says, look, don't speak as if you were speaking. We don't have time for that, guys. Speak as if you're speaking the words of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is who they need to see right now. We're losing daylight, guys. Speak as if speaking the words of the Lord. Maybe your audience is one person. Maybe your audience is a small group. Maybe your audience is 800 people. Speak as if speaking from the Lord. Every time we hit the stage, Pastor Gary, myself, Pastor Dave, even today in the back, we're all there huddled together praying, God, don't let Greg speak out of the flesh. God, once again, just like last night, make sure it's you who's speaking, not us, but you. That's why you hear us every time we come up before we open the word of God. God, please, please let this be of you. These are your words, not ours. When, I, when I'm talking to someone one-on-one -on -one in, in my office and someone's looking for comfort or counseling, and I pray that you would do this too because you guys will all be talking to people at some point. I'm praying in my mind as I'm listening to them, God, give me wisdom right now. God, give me the words that I need to say. God, give me just the right thing to say. Sometimes people are speaking to me and they're pouring out their hearts and I look dazed and like I'm totally like lost and not listening. No, no, I'm listening. I'm just a guy. I can't do too many things at once. But I'm praying, God, God, give me the words. And I pray that you guys would do that too. When you're encouraging someone, don't do it in your flesh. But what if your gift's not speaking? What if yours is service oriented? Well, he's got something for you because in verse 11 he continues if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Pause right there. Your gift might be something like hospitality, showing generosity, faithfulness, prayer. Maybe yours is service or helps, administration, logistical kind of stuff. Maybe it's doing the lights or doing the sounds, and you don't ever have to talk to people but if that's you, he says, serve with the strength of God. And this is important. Listen up. Because if this is you, this is so crucial. Because speaking gifts, compared to serving gifts, serving gifts have that tendency to become mundane and repetitive, right? When, when we preach or when you're counseling somebody, the situation's always changing. You always got to search for different messages and scriptures or, or, or truths. But when it's like scrubbing the toilets, or, or, or passing out cookies, or handing out Baywatch programs, it's easy for us to be like, yeah, I've been doing this for three months. I know how to pass out programs. Yeah, I've been doing this for a year now. I know what it's like to sweep the floors. I, I know how to shake people's hands. It doesn't really change. And the more comfortable we get with what we do in service, the more we reliant we are on ourselves. Right? And the more reliant we are on ourselves, the less reliant we are on God. So we go through the repetition. 
And we do the same thing over and over. This, this is easy. I know how to do this. Uh, you know, good job. I know many of you guys can do, do it with your eyes closed. I know you can do it with your hands tied behind your back. You could be bound and you could still do your job well. But look, Peter says, no, do it with the strength of God. Do it with the strength of God. So I challenge everybody, every time you come before the Lord in service, stop. Whatever you're doing, no matter how menial or mundane your task is, God, give me your strength. God, let your power manifest through me. Let your glory be on display as I do this, God. Because it's so easy for us to just come and accept this is who we are, this is what I do. Even, even me. For years, I've told myself, Greg, you are who you are. You preach like you preach, and that's, that's it. You'll never be a Francis Chan or a John Piper or John MacArthur or Stephen Furtick or Judah Smith. You are Greg, and this is, this is how good you are. And, and I think there's something good about that, right? I accept who God has made me to be. I'm okay with that. But these past few months, can I be honest with you? These past few months, I've, I've kind of changed my prayer. I've been praying, God, make me more effective. God, make me better at, at, at what I do. Help me to teach better. Help me to reach deeper. Help me to impact further, Lord. I want to do more. And I don't think that's a bad prayer because the Bible teaches us if you are faithful with what God has given you, he will give you more. That's, that's like a good thing in the Bible. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, desire and be eager for the greater gifts, gifts that reach people and build people. Be eager for those things. And so, church, I pray that whatever you do, that you would ask God, make me better. Let Christ be clear through me. Pray that I reach more and more people for Jesus. And as you do that, I believe God will honor that prayer. I believe he will increase your effectiveness. He will expand your boundaries. But be careful. Don't ever forget why we were given gifts. The point of Jesus giving us gifts were to use the gifts to point back to Jesus. Look at the verse as verse 11 closes. It says, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That wraps it all up. We serve to all. Serve and all. Serve and lead people in awe of Jesus, that they would be praising him and glorifying him. Acts chapter 14, the apostle Paul, he, he was given this gift, this opportunity to serve, and he heals this crippled man. Everybody knew this crippled man. He, he couldn't walk. Everybody knew that. And yet Paul and Barnabas come up, in the name of Jesus, be healed, and the guy's walking. And the whole town was in uproar. People started coming and bringing their sacrifices and offerings, throwing it at Paul's feet. Oh my God, Zeus has come in human form. That's what they said. These were the gods in the flesh. And what does Paul say? He says, don't do it. Don't do it. I am a man just like you. Look to the living God. And he tries desperately. He, he even tears his clothes in anguish. He says, don't worship me. Worship God. I'm a man just like you. Revelation chapter 19 and 22, two occasions, the angel of the Lord is sent to serve this apostle named John. That's his ministry. He's going to show John the glories and the revelation of what heaven's going to be like. He shows him the throne room of God. That's the lamb upon the throne. These are the people worshiping him. This is the eternal bliss that people will experience. And, and, and it says that John was so overwhelmed. Wouldn't you be? He's so overwhelmed with all that he's seeing of what heaven's going to be like. He falls to his knees and he starts worshiping the angel. He starts worshiping him two times. Natural reaction. And the angel says this, don't do it. Don't do it. Get up. I am a servant just like you. Serve him. Worship God. And you see in both Paul and the angel, they got it. They knew what they were called to do. They know why they were given these gifts, abilities, and service opportunities to point people to Jesus so that people would glorify and praise him, be left in awe of him. And so church, I pray that this moment, as, as we're losing daylight, that you would identify what is it that God has given me and how can I use it to leave people in awe of him. Let me close with this story. When I, when I was a... Uh, in my 20s, we went to a concert. 
it was uh, the Christian concert, Shane and Shane. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but talented musicians and vocalists, and everybody was so stoked to be here at this concert. And here we are, we're at this concert, and it was like, it, it had the buzz of a real rock concert, but, but as they're playing, they play some of their songs, and then, then they go into all these songs that I actually could sing to, songs that I actually sing in my youth group. And I remember it was, it was more like a worship night more than anything else. More than a concert, it was like a worship night. Everybody in that place just crying out and singing at the top of their lungs. And we got to the point in the night where we started singing this song that I knew. I know this song. And everybody knew it. And we're all singing, He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted. And I will praise His name. It was an oldie, but it was such a goodie. And you know that people were, I was like in the nosebleed seats. I could see everybody and everybody's just holding up their hands. Some people were down on their knees. People were just crying, to, crying out to Jesus in tears. He is exalted. The king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted, forever exalted. And I will praise his name. And, and we're sitting there, we're singing. And, and you know that, that thing they do when they, they cut out the music? They pull back from the mics and they say, just the voices. And, and we went a cappella. And now that place was loud. He is exalted. The king is exalted on high. Everybody's singing it out and we're singing through that chorus. And I'm just waiting for the band to come back in and, and close it off. It was going to be an epic ending to an epic night. And, and I'm just waiting. We're still going voices. And, and then it comes to a point where we're, we're at the end and... Nobody's saying anything at this point. It just stops. We're waiting for Shane and Shane to lead us back. And it's just quiet. It's just quiet. You can hear people sniffling and, and some people just praying. And I'm there in the nosebleed seats and I just open my eyes and I look down at the stage and I was shocked. It's empty. Not a single musician on that black stage. It was dark. No vocalists. Shane and Shane were all of a sudden gone. That's the concert. And I realized that these incredibly gifted men were using their talents to serve us, to bring us into the throne room, to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the name above all names, point us to Jesus. And as we're fixed on him, they are quietly and secretly exiting the stage as to draw no attention to themselves. But to leave us, the church, standing in ovation to Jesus, to our God. What an amazing night. That's what it looks like, guys. Jesus is coming. It could be any day now. We have no time to waste. What gifts has he given you? Pursue God and his holiness. Shock people and leave them in awe of the holy God in you. Use your gifts to serve people and leave them in awe of him. Amen? Christ is coming. How will you use your days to point people to Jesus? Let me pray for you guys. Lord, I pray that none of us would leave this place without that sense of urgency, Lord. We, we know that we can never call the day or the time, but that your word says we can know the seasons. And I think the season is ripe. I think we may very well be in the ninth month. Any day now, the, this arrival is coming. And so, Lord, get us ready, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't waste time, but that we would be watchful, looking for opportunities to point people to Jesus. That's what you've called us to do. And we look forward to that day when we're with you, Jesus, with all the people we are able to, to minister to. I, I want to just pray over you. If, if you just want to make a commitment today and say, God, I... I want to be used by you. God, I want to take the gift you've given me and I ask that you reveal it to me so that I can serve you and point people to you. Would you raise your hand? And I would love to just pray for you from where you are. Just love to pray over you, ask the Spirit of God to work through you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you for everybody raising your hands. I, I hope the whole church would be raising their hands right now. God, you see these people, and, and more than anything, you see their heart right now. I pray that you would see eagerness. And I pray that you would just, just honor that, Lord. Help us to do mighty things 
Lord, we're willing and we're wanting. Would you just do mighty things to them? Whatever the task is, whatever the service opportunity, let them have huge impact. And let them never lose focus of the goal to bring honor and glory and praise to the King of Kings. Raise up this church, God. We love you. We worship you. You are so worth everything we have, all our worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.